thank you to the University of Iowa Office of Strategic Communications and Clarity, if she's still here. She's been an amazing help getting the live stream thing happening. This is a first thing, first time thing for us at the museum. Um, thanks to Andy Evans, who is also a tech support person who's been amazing. And thanks to Elizabeth Wallace, who has been directing all of you, providing support in terms of publicity for this event and answering all the questions about parking. Mm -hmm. And thanks to the rest of the University of Iowa Museum of Art staff for supporting this event. And finally, thank you to James Wines <laughs> for agreeing to be here to speak tonight. Without art, the whole idea of sustainability fails. These words appear in the introduction to James Wines' book, Green Architecture. And these words have guided me personally through my academic and creative path since I first encountered them as an environmental studies major in undergrad. The founder of New York City-based architecture and environmental arts studio, SITE, James also serves as professor of advanced design studies at Pennsylvania State College of Arts and Architecture. His work focuses on aesthetic, sociological, and environmental concerns in the building arts. He is the winter, winner of 25 Art and Architecture Awards, including the 2013 National Design Award for Lifetime Achievement. His projects for SITE have been honored by retrospective exhibitions in the USA, Europe, and Japan. And his drawings can be found in the collections of more than 35 museums worldwide. But beyond all of these accolades, James is a passionate proponent of the beauty of the everyday, which I argue is what signage is all about. Few can so eloquently discuss the increasing urgency of climate change and our need to reimagine humanity's relationship with both the environments we build and the natural world. Join me in welcoming James Wines. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Beryl, really. Uh, she's an amazing woman, by the way. I have to compliment her. As she didn't compliment herself as she deserved. Uh, I, the reason I'm here, it's very hard for me to travel because I'm sort of crippled and, uh, and, and it's difficult to get around, so I don't do much of this. But I was perusing the internet and I found her description of this idea for this, for this conference. I said, this is something that's had to be done a long time. I've been fascinated with language for my whole life and the evolution, particularly of public language. And uh, she just sort of hit the jackpot. So we sort of aligned and so here I am. So I, I, I thank Vero first and foremost and, and the museum and all of you for coming. Okay, well, let's get, let's get started here. Um, signage, as we know, is, prevails everywhere. It is, Tokyo and New York and around the world. It's, it proliferates in spite of Instagram and the, uh, the internet, uh, which are big competitors. But uh, it's, it, what I thought I'd talk about tonight is sort of, since there's gonna be a conference tomorrow, is sort of a give up umbrella over the whole idea of what is signage. It has many, many interpretations, all rooted in language, but it, it's something that's fascinated me for all my life because there are so many ways of doing it. I mean, there, there's definitely street art, there's <coughs> uh, graffiti. I mean, I, I remember the whole graffiti generation in New York, they're the, the best of the best. And it's really the, the pride of, of, of situation, just watching your name come in on the subway. You know, they would love to paint on the front of the subway car because you'd watch your name plow into the station. So there's a little and whole range of energies. And of course, pop art was completely predicated on public language, on reinterpreting it, re giving it a different scale, different uh, frames of reference. Uh, again, pop art, I mean, just to look at the variations from public art to, to the use of the iconography of the written word, uh, Klaus Oldenburg's wonderful uh, soft calendar, Roy Lichtenstein, uh, you know, Ed Rusha. I mean, there's just an enormous number of interpretations. And I think tomorrow, a lot of them are going to cover them. And then there's just you as your, you know, people as their, their own agendas. The, your entire agenda can be on your t-shirt. Uh, I'm particularly reinforced by the one down there. Fat people are hard to kidnap. That one, <laughs> that one appeals to me. In North, I feel safe. But at any rate, there are all these interpretations of, of, of publicizing ideas and issues. Um, 
from tattoos. I mean, cultures have whole ranges of body painting and tattoos. Uh, <laughs> then there's the message tattoo. I always wonder why they're always in Old English. There's something, there's a, <laughs> there, is, there are some very curious factors involved here. Uh, and then, then, of course, my favorites are the suicide girls. They you know, have to be heavily tattooed. They're part of a club. And uh, they show their bodies in various degrees. I, I always think that every campus needs a, a suicide girl club it's just to, to liven things up. I'm, I'm, I'm from a Midwest, <laughs> I've been on Midwestern campuses, and I'm from a, a mid-state campus. And then finally, there's the, 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 the sign as the person. The, the saturation of media has made certain faces and bodies so iconic that you, know, you can have a, a situation like this. Uh, the, the sexiest man alive thing. Uh, you know, for example, I mean, uh, it, it must feel good. Yeah, like Brad Pitt gets a telephone call, you're the sexiest man in the world. And he feels good for a while. But then think about it, the rest of his life. Every time Brad Pitt pops into bed with a woman, she's always sitting there with a sardonic expression on her face, and folded arms, and say, OK, big boy, show me. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, a, it's a cute instant impotence, it would seem to me. And, and it's, it's probably why he drinks a lot. It's definitely why he drinks a lot. Uh, whoops. Oh, what did I do? Turn it off? Okay. Um, I, I actually had a, my own kind of body experience. I mean, I, I show this picture. I, probably everyone in this audience is too young to know who Pamela Anderson is. But there was a, a, tel a television program where these nubile young uh, lifesavers, lifeguards, were always saving people and solving crimes. And it was very, very popular. And Pam Anderson is one of the, uh, the key figures. So Pam Anderson is an environmentalist. And re about three or four months ago, six, no, yeah, just about that, um, Bjork Engels, who's of course one of the hottest new younger generation architects, and I were invited as keynote speakers at this conference with Pam Anderson. So, so, you know, we, I mean, this is the celebrity experience of our lives. You know, here, here's the co-speaker, Pam. That's my wife in the background with her typical, <laughs> her typical attitude towards situations like this. But naturally, uh, Bjork, you know, young, handsome, international, and uh, the old codger in the wheelchair. We're, all, we're both here sitting there competing for Pam's attention. And I mean, this is really, this is all part of signage. I'm not, I'm not off track here. This is part of signage. But anyway, so uh, who does, what kind of men does Pam like? Well, she obviously married the uh, Motley Crue drummer, uh, Tommy Lee, heavily tattooed. And so when you look at the kind of men Pam likes and the two faces at the top, which one do you think she picked? Well, <laughs> I mean, here we are, you know, locked in, a, in I guess, an architectural polemic. But, 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 you know, Pam really, I, I mean, she saw pure animal appeal sitting in front of her. And uh, you can tell, just look, look at her body language in this particular picture. You can tell that she doesn't want to talk about architecture. She just wants to tear the shirt off my back, you know. And, and, in, and she, because she probably senses that under the T-shirt, there is, Pommy Lee and I have a great, a great deal in common. So... Well, anyway, this is all about signage. And um, <laughs> so uh, back getting a little more in perspective here. Uh, this is about, according to Rivero, more or less about signage on the stores. And, uh, you know, there's a, it, it, there's a kind of a catastrophe in the big box world now because uh, most of the signage is pretty unimaginative, but also so are the sales uh, mechanisms and the, the whole psychology of, the, of that kind of business and, and, and there's always the competition of the internet. So this is a different world. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. And this, this, this notion of the competition is, is pretty overwhelming. I mean, I, I've just been through it myself trying to order a wheelchair, a special kind. And, you know, you, you think, well, should you go to the store or should you get it off the internet? So there is this world where the signage is shifting. The signage is, 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 is digital too, as well as, as physical. And another aspect, I mean, Instagram and the internet and Twitter and all these things. It, it, another thing is the way people use their own body. I mean, the, the, the selfie idea where, and, and they're always sending you stuff like this. I always wonder why people send 
themselves in this various stages of undress. Some people you, you sort of like to see undress, but then there's others you wish you would just stay attired. You know, why do they send you these pictures? But at any rate, um, there is a very, very competitive world of signies. There is, a, there is all of the signs and symbols, not only of the internet world, um, but there is this thing called, which is the basis of what I'm going to talk about tonight, which is communication. Or in other words, what is it all about and, and where did it all come from? And uh, quite seriously, the, probably the single most profound invention in the history of the human uh, species is the first person who scribbled symbols in the sand who wanted to communicate. Uh, because after that, everything else could happen. You, you had to have somebody invent language uh, before you could, you could have it on buildings, you could have it as part of the societal structure, before you could have culture and science and literature and anything. And it is interesting, I'm, and I just put these up here, because you, you, the cuneiform, well, I think language is traceable, really crafted, language, phonetics, and stuff, goes about, about, back about 10 or 15,000 years, not much farther. That's a little ancient Chinese. Uh, it was very interesting the way people work with, 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 with symbols. In other words, you wanted to say something about bright sun, so you had a combination of the dark sun, which would be the moon and the sun, and you put them together, and you have bright sun. But then that becomes symbolic as well. And then you have you know, scripts that take take the different forms. And then you have the most remarkable of all in early signage is, is of course, the Paleolithic cave paintings. So some of them up now up to 40,000 years old. So 40,000 years ago, not only did they have an enormously sophisticated aesthetic, but they also were, were beginning to form symbols and signs within these. I mean, the, the, uh, the, just the aesthetic quality, the selection, the, the use of these various uh, raised and indented surfaces to describe the volume of these animals. Obviously, mostly they were celebrating the hunt. You know, it was hunter-gatherers, I guess, and they were celebrating the hunt. But they find an enormous number of remarkable examples of with them, they're also developing abstract symbols. And then there was that, that, those remarkable caves I, I think they're uh, in Santa Cruz, which are hands in which they actually blew some kind of, from their mouths, I guess, blew um, a spray and silhouetted their hands. And then uh, later they realized, I think the uh, paleontologists and the archaeologists and everybody who's been looking at this, these are all women's hands. So then they began to speculate that probably some of the first cave art was done by women. It was a, a woman's art form because I, 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 one would assume the men are out, you know, killing the bison or hunting down the deer or, you know, bringing home the meal. And the women were with the children and had more leisure time and began art. I mean, it really were the founders of art. I mean, that's, you know, again, speculated, but it's, but it's a point. But it is interesting just to look at the, at the way signs and symbols have evolved. I mean, here, here you start in Sumeria, and you start with the head of a bull or an ox, and then it looks less like an ox in Chinese, and then it looks not at all like an ox in English. But you still have something left of the, of the visual um, illustrative iconography. And I find this is very, very fascinating. And then, of course, as it evolves later, it becomes, it goes from pictographs to cuneiform inscriptions, hieroglyphics, phonetic writing, and gets more and more and more and more complex. And by the time you get to Egypt, it's, it's already divided into three strat stratas of language. There's the totally pictographic for people who are basically can't read. Then there's a more symbolic language for the business community, you know, the trade community. And there's a sort of the high language, I guess, of the uh, pharaohs and the priests or whatever. So you have all these strata. And then, of course, talk about public signage uh, in Egypt. It was spectacular. Uh, buildings were encrusted with signage. And uh, it, it's sort of tragic in some cases because they would take these beautiful, beautiful uh, relief murals and then they would write right on top of the next generation would write right over it to change the message or alter it or, or expand upon it. So you really have these phenomenal origins and then the origins of language taking within the shape of the society or in the shape of the context, like the hanging gardens or hangs dung. 
in China are, are glued to a mountainside, so the language of the architecture and the language of the mountain are, 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 are part of the, of the message that's being delivered. And then, of course, as you progress, the, the churches and, and, and mosques and says, uh, did the, more or less the same thing. Having lived in Italy for a long period of my life, I, I became very appreciative of public iconography. I mean, the, the richness of it and uh, just the capacity, in this case, of course, for taking advantage of light and shadow. You know, it's something we sort of missed out on in a lot of contemporary architecture. You know, a, a, a real consummate understanding of the power of light and shadow to deliver messages. Uh, Again, you look at a church like Orvieto Cathedral, it's, it's nothing but messages. It's the, you know, it's the internet of its time. You would come to the public square, you'd, you, know, you, you would you know, shop and buy vegetables and you know, uh, purchase an a evening meal, but at the same time you were being delivered civic and religious messages from the front of the building. So they became, and they're incredibly enriched. Uh, you know, it wasn't that these messages were in any way passive. For example, if you didn't like the cardinal in your community, you could actually carve the effigy right into the wall of the building. So there was a lot of public criticism going on. It wasn't, you know, just celebrations of heaven and hell, but it really, it really, when you look at it closely, you realize that, it's in, that buildings were, in fact, the signs. The buildings and the signs were simultaneous events. And that becomes incredibly important. As you can see, what I'm trying to do today is, I say, put a kind of an umbrella over what I will be discussed tomorrow. I, 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 I'm very impressed with a lot of the subjects that have been chosen by my colleagues. And uh, they're going to touch on all of these things, I'm sure. But I thought I would try to kind of sum it up, that fact that the building and the image and the iconography and the messages, you know, coming together in this incredibly powerful way. Uh, then by the time the 19th century rolled around, it began to change. It's very interesting, the potency and the power of 12th, 13th, 14th century churches began to diminish a lot. I, I, mean, I think the whole origination of the modern movement, the rebellion of the modern movement was against, by the time you got to the 19th century, and even as good as the Gagné uh, opera, Paris opera is, the, the iconography, the language is rather empty. It's derivative, it's historic, it, it no longer has its relevance, it no longer it has its power. And part of the reason was that uh, the major patrons of churches and civic buildings were, were being overthrown. Uh, the, the, you know, the popes and the cardinals were losing their power, the kings and queens were being eliminated. And that was the beginning of the advent of, of the idea of private language, private art. So you begin to have the artist in the studio as the source of, of culture, the source of art. And that and then, you know, kind of logically following that, you have a movement that sort of kind of sweeps away all of the iconography of the past, all of that civic and church iconography, and becomes the industrial age. And here in the building of the Eiffel Tower, even in the pictures that illustrated it, this was beginning the advent of the new social era, the, uh, the new industrial era. You were going to suddenly you know, have all these incredible jobs and work in, for the future. So much of that was embodied, of course, in the, in the imagery that followed. And you know, this, of course, influenced everyone. I mean, this, these industrial age factories, all the architects that if we all lived at that time, we would all be applauding the you know, Spartan language of industrial buildings and industrial cities, and then try to incorporate that into the image, what we call modernism in the 20th century. And as you can see in the, in the Voisin plan of, for Paris at Le Corbusier, I kind of thank God it never got built, because it, it thank heavens the real Paris is still there. But uh, still, you, you see that, you know, the, the individual, uh, 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 you know, re receiving information from a building is disappearing, and you're, you're expected to experience vast spaces, vast slabs of concrete, and vastly high buildings with, with essentially no, no real message other than the, the you know, ex experience the industrial civilization. So the whole world has been built, as we know, on, on this uh, 
archetype, this, 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 this city everywhere, cities everywhere look exactly the same. You know, you, you can Singapore, Dubai, Panama City, Mumbai, Shanghai, everywhere the paradigm is the same. And I think we're probably, as, you know, since this has been going on for gathering for about a hundred years, you know, no art movement lasts forever. Even the much disdained Beaux Arts, you know, disappeared in about thirty-five years. It only lasted a short time. But we've had the modern movement around an awful long time, and the and what it's communicating, the, the language of communication is wearing thin for one thing and it's also producing you know a public domain that's very bleak um, i like this quotation from jane jacobs the pseudoscience of planning seems almost neurotic in its determination to imitate empiric failure and ignore empiric success and uh, she was really a great advocate of the vitality needed in public space the language that we exchange is it and the, and that's where signage of course comes in as a very important factor and then you have something like, you know, right outside of Paris, you have the Le Défense area, and uh, it's, it's a kind of totally modernist commitment, but you can see the, 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 the location and the condition and the treatment of humanity is very much like ants crawling around the surface. The, 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 the individual is losing, losing the, the power here, their, their, their identity. And then, of course, you know, you, you have, you know, the, rebuilding of the of the World Trade Center, which is an exact duplicate of every every mistake that was made in the first place. Another thing that's it's, it's kind of tragic to me, I started out as a sculptor and um, and uh, so I, I, I get I had a time of developing it in a more formalist uh, sort of way, but uh, and then later became sort of anti-formalist. But I mean, look at that Trade Center, that Freedom Tower. I mean, there's probably not a living sculptor stupid enough to do that kind of shape i mean it is really terrible sculpture you just can't look at it any other way it's a very bad piece of sculpture but a very aggressive statement in the public domain and also there's this this obsession with tallest buildings i always think a lot of under endowed men are out there trying to show <laughs> show some kind of power or something by the oh mine is longer than yours sort of like donald trump Anyway, uh, well, let's go back to kind of the origins of signage and, and public communication in America. It was very rich, actually. It came from Italy uh, and at the eye of the false front building. <clears throat> and if you're out in kind of the wilderness, especially the West, Western states and everything, you had to kind of pop up against the sky to identify your presence and also what you're selling or what your messages were. And... Uh, as it went on, it became, you know, the whole sides of buildings became part of that public communication. In fact, these are now, I guess, being preserved. These ghost signs are, are antiques that are being preserved with, with, with increasing frequency because they do have a kind of power. <coughs> and they also uh, harken back to sort of better times where, we, where somehow you felt that the person advertising was really communicating with you individually, and whereas that's being lost a lot. Uh, then we get to uh, you know Times Square, the early Times Square. I mean, remember the, sign, the Camel's man who smoked? The smoke came out of the sign. That was considered revolutionary at that time. But you can sort of see the proliferation of signage and also the competition for communication in the in the public domain. This is this was always a wonderful one. I I, I remember this one from my from my early years, just like this. And just, just Nathan's famous just became, you know, the hot dogs were good, but it was an awful lot to do with the nature of the Coney Island environment, Atlantic City environment, I'm sorry, and the, um, the power and, and the proliferation of, of uh, texts on the buildings themselves. Well, then we get to something that is, is, the, is the grounding for almost everything in American public domain is our automobile culture. That, that is the pinnacle of this change and the American gas station, which, uh, I mean, imagine gasoline at 15 cents a gallon. But they were incredibly iconic and it was very interesting. In fact, like the very early cars that had to look somewhat like horse-drawn carriages because they, they couldn't be too unfamiliar. People couldn't really accept that an engine rather than a horse 
<coughs> would mobilize its vehicles. So the first cars look like carriages and the first gas stations look like the kind of your home. They sort of kept that little, you know, provincial house with it because you wanted to feel that, okay, you're going in there to, to, to buy fuel for your engine, but you want to feel comfortable. You want to be able to buy something else. You want to be able to have a friendly feel. So the iconography and the, and the language of the early gas stations were very much conditioned and very much drawn from the, the private house, the, the, the duality of the private domain and the, and the public domain. And even the gas pumps, they used to, I always say they used to be so much better. They, they were much more like something that was being delivered in a tube or in a liquid form. <clears throat> As they became slicker and slicker and more modern, they lost, interesting enough that they lost that message in a way. They, they, they're probably servicing slicker shaped cars, more streamlined, but in a way they lost the, the power of that original message. Uh, but anyway, just looking at the, the evolution of the gas station is really, really, really very interesting because then it becomes more modernized. It becomes, the cars become sleeker and the, the, also the mobile oil, the, the, the typography uh, becomes slicker and you begin to emerge into you know, you, you know, all of these logos that each oil company had to have a logo that would in some sense reflect their product. So you can see competitive logos going, going wild in the, in, in the oil industry. And then of course came the Googie and Modern styles, especially in California. And I think that was really to, to not only make the building, but also make the, the, the uh, linguistics of it and also the uh, topography feel like you're moving quickly, feel like you're moving along at high speed. That, you know, if, you, if you stop there and buy, and buy this fuel, uh, you gain a certain kind of personal power from the gas station. And then even great, great designers like Mies van der Rohe designed the gas station and uh, Edward Hopper painted them. Ed Rouchard, you know, made a whole life of icon of the standard station. And, and then you know, they, be, they began to get more and more varied. But it's interesting, as they become better designed, by people like Norman Foster, uh, and Arnie Jacobson got involved, Frank Lloyd Wright even, uh, they somehow, other than the Frank Lloyd Wright one, they kind of lost that, that intimacy. They, they were beginning to get so far away that you didn't feel that sense of the delivery of power, or the delivery of a fossil fuel in your car. Well, then there's also this other whole thing, what I call prosthesis as mobility, where teenagers in the 50s and 60s would take a car and really, in the, like, like Prothesis, they would transform the car completely. They would, they would use the central icon of the car, but then completely redevelop it into a, a, another kind of vehicle. Again, representative not only of rebellion, of, of youth activity. Uh, I love that Hot Rod Girl, the movie. Um, uh, American graffiti were all built around the auto culture and the, and the, and, and the Hot Rod and the fact that you, you personally could operate on your vehicle and transform it. It would become, become even more iconic and more like a sign. And then after that, of course, you had, you know, had uh, roadway restaurants which were, which were you know, objects in themselves. If you had a donut stand, it became a donut. If you had a hot dog stand, it became a hot dog. So there was that, again, that imagery of, of, of total illustration as part of that sunny stream. Well, out of all this, you know, it became an intellectual content as well uh, among the early architects who really looked at this situation, the, the, the communicative world, uh, were uh, Bob Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, uh, and they really looked at it. You know, these are quotes from Venturi, modern is about space, postmodern is about communication. You should do what turns you on. For young Americans in the 1940s, Las Vegas is to the Strip what the Rome is to the Piazza. And there, those are very astute observations. And they did these two books, which became very, very, of course, very, very impressive. And, and, and the, the, and the um, message that was being delivered here was, uh, was very astute, and, uh, particularly in the part of, uh, of Venturi's complexity and contradiction. He said Main Street is almost all right, meaning that 
there's something enriching about it. There's something humanizing. There's something where you, <clears throat> the individual connects to the signage and to the buildings. And it's funny because when Disney does it, it begins simulations again. It begins to become simulated and nowhere near as, as communicative as the real thing. Um, and then, of course, then you begin to get more and more and more and more intense where the actual choices of typeface uh, and the building literally is becoming the sign. The building and the sign become simultaneous events, which is something that Venturi looked at and Denise Scott Brown looked about a lot. And, and both of them were right. If you look at the, the visual vitality of all the images I'm showing around and then look at Millennium Park in Chicago, you can certainly see a vast distance, uh, difference in character, in, in quality of life, but you also have a vast difference in the actual ability to communicate in the public domain. There really is. And it was a, a very insightful thing that this is a lot more fun. It's, it's, it's considered banal or vulgar or something by, by, by the architectural profession, especially the diehard modernists, but it is, it does have inherent in it a kind of vitality that didn't, didn't exist before. Venturi took off on that, and, I, and, and, and some of his best things, well, I think one of the best things he did, the Football Hall of Fame, was not built, but it was the idea that oh, you'd be an entire building which would <coughs> be an electronic play of great mo uh, moments in the history of football. The whole building was going to be a signage. He went on to do, do, you know, in a sense, more modest versions. The Columbia Fire Station was one, and of course the <coughs> Guild House. Again, where you're adapting, looking at existing typologies, just existing ways that buildings have, and then uh, very gently sort of turning them and giving them a, 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 a more power, more uh, communicative power, just by very, very slight juxtaposition of form and space. Um, Venturi also uh, worked with one of my clients, which was uh, Best Products, uh, which I'm going to talk about later. Uh, uh, and he also worked with Basco, you know, you know doing, a, again, the sign as the building, where the, the whole building became the word Basco. And in the case of Best, the whole word became, uh, you know, the, this, the giant floral designs. The one uh, uh, thing about <coughs> the Venturi argument that you, you kind of you're using architecture uh, to in a way emulate or draw uh, vitality from signage, pop art did it better in a way because what you, what you were doing with in the case of, of Andy Warhol and, and Roy Lichtenstein and people like that is you were hyperbolizing something that was not normally accepted as art at all. And, and by, by blowing it up to large scale or by uh, the strange inverse juxtaposition, you change the meaning. Whereas when uh, Venturi was trying to do it with architecture, it didn't read as, as, as strongly. It, it, it really, because architecture had already through Las Vegas and through public signage and Times Square, and it had already done it, and, and it did it in a much way. For example, a Roy Lichtenstein, uh, that wonderful hello, you know, that, that isolated cold moment, or taking the Bende dots and blowing them up to monumental scale, just a scale referencing alone changed your whole attitude towards what, what the, the pop image really was. And again, Venturi tried to do it with the American pavilion, American flag, and a... And a Philadelphia Orchestra, but it do, I don't think it works quite as well. Well, anyway, then after that, of course, came high decor postmodernism in, in Charles Jenks and, and uh, the postmodern exhibition in London. And actually, I contributed a very critical essay to that, and they sort of isolated my essay because I really said that I didn't think that the most vital elements of postmodernism came from architecture at all. They came from performance and psychology and and in, in other art forms, it was postmodernism literature was much more powerful. But anyway, uh, you know, Michael Graves became a kind of hero of the postmodern movement, but again, with kind of historical referencing, uh, which the media picked up on and, and then they loved it. I never particularly, you know, felt close to this at all. I felt that the, uh, the referencing was, you know, the, the real thing 
uh, the real Piazza Italia, has, having lived in Italy, had far more vitality in communication than doing it ironically or, you know, it was, you know, it was too close to the, the actual um, source and therefore it sort of weakened it, in my view. And it's had the same too with the graphic styles, the choices of, of fonts and everything. They, they became kind of if you please sort of politeness in it that, that didn't seem to be, have much vitality. <clears throat> and one of the, the weirdest and most perverse is of course the new Las Vegas, which is infinitely less interesting than the old Las Vegas, but where they're sort of making these cartoon uh, versions of Venice and New York, these, these sort of microcosmic versions. And so I guess you, with the theory that you never really have to real, visit real Venice or real uh, De Nork because they've already got it there right for it in, in the downtown of, of Las Vegas. Well, this brings up a very important turning point in philosophy and thinking. One of the, of course, main influences, Baudrillard, the theory of simula uh, simulacrum, and basically what he's saying is that the simulated is so powerful and so, so all-absorbing that whatever it represents is not as, as meaningful or is not as sincere. He says that you live in a world where there's more and more information and less and less meaning. People have replaced all reality and meaning with symbols and signs. So our experiences are a simulation of reality. So in the process, we, of course, we lose reality. And uh, this has been pondered a lot, and it's, it's, it's a situation I, I, I tend to agree with, is that after a while, the fake is, 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 is the only real, and so you're living in this simulacra world. Well, anyway, this is, I'm just doing all of this as a little bit of present. I'm going to talk about Seitz's work and you know, where we went. But certainly reading Baudrillard was part of the influence. And also, you know, looking at the situation I've just described to you, uh, looking at, you know, the revolutions of the 20th century. I mean, Picasso's uh, Demoiselle Zavignon is, is, is uh, the reason he did it is he obviously did not want to do Peter Paul Rubens. He, he, he wasn't into a uh, Renaissance perspective. In fact, he wanted to put the foreground and the background and the background and the foreground and distort our views of reality, but by still referring to them as well. And of course, collage was just totally revolutionary. I mean, the fact that you could combine illusion and reality in a single work. And uh, Duchamp was one of the biggest influences in my life. I mean, this idea, he started as a Cubist artist, but then became a conceptual artist where the content drew heavily on, on the situation where painting a mustache on the Mona Lisa, for example, was, was horrific when you think of it, but on the other hand, a, 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 a marvelous commentary on san a sanctified culture, which he was really rebelling against, and putting a urinal in an art gallery. A, it, it seems on one hand absurd, but on the other hand, in the absurdity, it changed our entire view of what art was all about. You know, it, it, again, if a Henry Moore with all those kind of big oh, amoebic shapes, I mean, they're crafted shapes, so is that art or is the displacement of art art? I mean, clearly, if you, you walked into a gallery and you're a little sitting there, you have to question the entire context. So I, I, I liked his work a lot, even the work he did with architectural elements, the Lurie, Lurie door, which is a door that opened and closed on the bathroom and the kitchen. So it was always a door that was open and closed. It was either open in the kitchen or closed in the bathroom and vice versa. Uh, the large glass uh, was, a, was actually done for Catherine Dreyer's uh, as a window her, to her garden. So you'd have to reconcile the activity of nature in the garden with the transition point, which is a pa transparent painting, and then back into the room with the actual iconography on the painting, the imagery on the painting. So uh, Duchamp had an had a influence on all of us, he really did. The idea of you know, the surrealist exhibition where his, his exhibition was stringing wires all over the room so you couldn't get to, in to see the exhibition. Uh, and, uh, but again, these are two words, I think, are two uh, thoughts that I think every architect should think about. I taught myself to contradict myself in order to avoid conforming to my own tastes. I'm interested in ideas, not mere visual products. So uh, 
I was part of what started really in the late 60s, early 70s, a period which we I call our chart. But it involved a number of artists who were, had either studied architecture or were in the environmental art mood, but at the same time referencing architecture. And it included quite a few exciting works and interesting people. And it did, it was the beginning of that change. You know, what Picasso said is so true, forcing yourself to use restricted means is a sort of restraint that liberates invention. It obliges you to make the kind of progress you can't even imagine in advance. And Gordon Matta Clark was, was, was exceptional in that regard. He would take, for example, the building that was going to be torn down or abandoned, and then he would ins make these incisions in the building. And it was sort of preservation by demolition because people would have to save it because it was a work of art because he had operated on the building and changing the whole space and the condition of, of you know, formal architecture or even the traditional house. In Paris, he did this huge cutting conical in intersect as a kind of commentary on the uh, Pompidou Center that was being built right across the street. He, was, he really didn't like that kind of, you know, you know pretentious, you know, industrial age architecture. So he was, he was in the process of cutting up the building while the Pompidou Center was being built as again, a kind of architectural commentary. This is a work by Johnny Pettin, I was actually, I just wrote a forward for a book on his work that's coming out. But he was a, an Italian artist who was working in the middle, Midwest, but in one case, he, while he, uh, these people were, he was teaching the school and the people were away on vacations, so he and the students, Mud, mud cakes, the entire house. They covered the entire house with mud. And uh, it was kind of an ecological statement, even though some of the best buildings in the world in history were built with mud, mud brick. So it was a comment on that. And then he did another thing. This was an abandoned grade school building. He and the students during the Christmas holidays got up on the roof and ran water over the building for about two weeks and did uh, 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 this ice structure as well. And uh, this is Vito Acconci, who, as you probably know, passed away about a month or so ago, a marvelous artist. But he had an incredible show at, at the Mock Vienna, the big museum there, in which he completely disoriented you in, 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 the, in certain rooms. There were certain familiar exhibition rooms, and he completely changed that space. So uh, the, the, one of the big things, of course, in, in, in communicating in, in the world is public space, and I mentioned it before. I mean, look at how, how intense it can be. I mean, the, the entire city of Detroit, which built in this sort of voisin plan, became the only bankrupt city in the history of the United States. And the, the World Trade Center, which was uh, singled out as being the enemy, uh, or at the time of 9-11, was also earlier, ironically, the enemy of New York. And there was an article in the New York Magazine, I think a year and a half or before 9-11, which uh, was on the cover that the, the World Trade Center buildings in the plaza are the most unpopular architecture in New York. So uh, there was something to that, and, and it really true. I mean, I, I, my office in New York is very, only two blocks from 9-11, so you can imagine the situation. But I, I always hated this space, and, and, and look at this little kid, he's running in terror from public art, you know, I mean. So obviously, you know, this, these, this kind of communication in the public domain doesn't, doesn't work very well. When I think of Italy, you know, my idea of a fountain in Italy was, was, was like this, and this is New York's idea of a fountain a few years ago. I mean, this is like guilty urination or something. It really is. It's like a, not, not exactly my, my, it would be my choice of imaginative thinking. Again, in Italy, I mean, everybody in the world goes to the Trevi Fountain, but it's, it's a masterfully perverse work of art because, you know, Niccolo Salvi, you know, sort of morphed the, the, uh, the uh, palace there into, into a whole environment. It's, 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 the building is, is morphing back into nature and, uh, you know, if a contemporary artist did that, that would be pretty avant-garde. It's, it's, it's an amazing work. Well, anyway, uh, you know, go back to the Trevi Fountain again. I mean, it is a, people go there right by the millions every year because it is, in fact, a people space because of its scale, because of the articulation and so forth. And all of the spaces around it are relatively recent public spaces in, in New York and elsewhere. 
And as you can see, there is this kind of lack of communication. There is a lack of public language. It's just bleak. It, you know, there's the potted tree or there's a, the little piece of sculpture. That what I, you know, came to call the turd in the plaza is that this idea, I mean, buildings, that, yeah, one time communicated and it absorbed information and then gave it back. And now the, the art and the architecture are to totally separate. So I spent a lot of my life kind of fighting this thing, you know, this idea of plop art. And I, somebody actually, this is just recently sent me this, this is a shit fountain in which an artist has actually uh, cast excrement in, in bronze and mounted it as a public work. So yeah, he, I guess he took, I wrote this article uh, in 1970 for Art in America and I put these two phrases of the language, plop art and the turd in the plot, and they sort of stuck around. <laughs> But actually, when I teach, I actually do make this public communication thing a big issue. And at the beginning of a semester, if I'm teaching, especially something with architecture and public space, and I show the students this image on the screen, I say, look, uh, there's one thing that's going to happen this semester. You're going you're to look at the public domain in a more imaginative and inventive way. And if I see anything on your drawing board or your computer desktop that looks like anything in this picture, you fail the course. <laughs> well, you can imagine. I mean, it, it, it sort of wipes out. I mean, their blood drains out of their faces because they're, they're terrified because these are the cliches that every single you know, public space seems to still possess. Well, this is one of the first projects of, of site that was sort of anti that plop art idea. And the idea was basically by asphalting over a parking lot full of cars, you were really um, making art that could not be moved. You, you, you could, if you, to show this in a museum or a gallery, uh, would lose all, it would lose all meaning. It has to be where it is. So it's essential that the art be located in this place. It's on the total opposite of a Henry Moore sitting in a pool. And uh, it did become, you know, it was sort of the starting point of Seitz's work. And uh, even the process of doing it uh, became, you know, iconic. Uh, people would come from miles around just to watch us bury the cars. <laughs> I remember there was a, a high school right next door and a bunch of tough kids, you know, they saw us lining up all these cars. And they didn't know what we were going to do with it. And so they were always threatening to, you know, come at night and, you know, tear the cars apart and, you know, exercise a little vandalism on it. So we had to have a guards to protect the cars. And then finally one day they came back and they, these same kids saw us burying the cars. And it was an incredible moment of revelation because any self-respecting vandal knows when they've been outdone. <laughs> and so, and they couldn't have had more respect. You can't imagine... If I said the word coffee, three kids ran and got coffee for me. It was a, a great respect to, to the, for doing the ghost park. And it did. And these, are, these are some of the kids who, who had threatened to, to violate our cars. Anyway, uh, we did a whole series of things with uh, inverse public spaces. This is another one in Japan. It was a children's plaza, children's plaza for the Isuzu car company. It's on the other side of the, police, uh, of the uh, railway station. But you can see it was a typical railway station situation. And Azuzo, it was very interesting. They, as, uh, when we got the client, they said, I said, well, what do you, we always ask the client, kind of, what do you want? What's your psychology about this whole thing? What do you want to do? They said, well, we want it to be like outer space. And we want it to be like a Japanese garden. And we also want to have you celebrate the Azuzu car. So how do you make a plaza for children that's like outer space the Japanese garden and the car. So, you know, we say, well, in outer space, they're up to roll around in space. The, gal uh, the garden always has these stones coming up out of the ground, and of course, there's the car. So what we did is we inverted the entire plaza. These are real people. They are, we cast <laughs> Japanese families, which is difficult in Japan because people don't like to get in kind of being cast like this. But we created an entirely in inverse... Uh, Plaza, you can see that there's a, the ground line is in space, in the air. So everything, including the bicycle tires and the bottom of the feet and everything touched in space. And, it, and then we did the roots of the trees and everything. And it became a really popular public space, you can imagine. I mean, kids just loved it because 
it was perverse and it was the opposite of a you know typical playground it wasn't there was something else going on here there was another level of communication well uh, this idea of the building is the sign uh you know which i've been talking about or the space is the sign is something that we really took seriously and uh this is something you know certainly the venturis both uh applauded in their books and their writings and it is a powerful part of the american landscape in other words for, for better or for worse whether considered ugly or banal or whatever if you kind of look at it differently you begin to realize it is a source of enormous vitality another thing that uh, i've always been sort of since i did sort of kind of constructive a sculpture I wanted to get as far away from formalism and that kind of thing as possible, certainly in doing architecture. And I, I, I really like the idea that buildings have archetypes. They, they do. Everybody knows what a skyscraper is supposed to look like, or a bank, or a colonial home, or a farmhouse, or you know, fast food restaurants, or shopping centers. They, they have archetypal shapes and meanings. And so think about art that to me the most interesting is you can take advantage of people's prejudices or people's predispositions towards situations and uh, so when you look at the most all these shopping centers the signage is always the same there are bright colors and, and the way they're communicating is always uh, almost identical it's just changes from from uh, you know whoever is the, the owning the ownership company yes whether uh, you know, Target has a nice logo, but but the idea, even in invading it with postmodern decor and so forth, still keeps the thing the same. It is the same, but it doesn't change. So, uh, uh, collectors of my early work, actually, and also uh, big patrons of, uh, especially pop art and conceptual art, were the Sidney Francis Lewis, and they had a shopping center company. And if you ever go to Virginia, you see the Virginia Museum. Their collection is spectacular, not only of art, but of furniture as well. But anyway, they had been building these very ugly boxes on highways. And, and uh, <clears throat> so they came to me one day. This is when we were just starting site, And said to me, well, you know, every complains that our buildings are ugly and we collect art. And why, do we, why isn't the building more art? And, and, you know, why can you do something? So we looked at the whole strip phenomenon the big box store and they're all essentially the, the whole mentality behind them was the same and then i looked back back at you know my origins of sensibility in italy and and even early america and you realize there was this tradition of communicating with the archetypal building you never knew what a church looked like but you you could vary it and 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 invade it with other ideas and make something really quite wonderful so we made our first presentation to uh, Sidney Francis Lewis. I, I used the turd in the plaza. I mean, I said, well, you don't want that, anything like that Henry Moore in front of your building, do you? Oh, he said, no, no, no. He says, that would take up parking spaces. <laughs> and, uh, and then it, we said, well, you wouldn't want anything really postmodern. You don't want any classicism. Oh, he says, no, 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 that'll make us look too expensive. Well, one thing that would have been going on right at the time we started working for them is the Orbox had just built this new, I think uh, Cesar Pelli designed it, but the new Orbach was considered the cutting edge. It was advertised as the cutting edge of big box shopping center design. And, you know, it had nice color, a new logo, better graphics and aluminum trim. I mean, it had all this, you know, the stuff that you would expect, you know, a modernist design firm to do. So we, when we opened this building, the first day it opened, it really did have an impact. It really did because it was an inversion of that entire circumstance. It was taking it and, and celebrating the process of building it or process of taking it away simultaneously. And of course became, you know, the beginning of the site, the site structures, the site buildings, that whole series. And, it, and again, the building became the sign. Uh, and there, that bricklayer, that old time bricklayer, you know, who did the project really was very devoted, obviously. And they asked him actually, when he finished uh, his job, he said, well, what are you going to do now? He says, well, I'm going to quit because I can't go back to the old way. <laughs> so it was a really, it was kind of psychological. So we did a series of structures for them, which really were all about the building and the sign as simultaneous events. This is a building that actually moved. And so that you know, it was motorized by actually the people who did the lunar rover. It was very complex to do it. 
But the idea that Billy would open and close every day. So you could, instead of you being the only active component, you would stand still and the building would move. And as it moved out, it became a public art piece at a public space. When it was closed up, it was a building. So it was both art and building simultaneous, simultaneous events. Uh, this is a building, again, fragmenting. It was done in Florida where the sunlight is amazing. So taking the building apart, or you can address the, the archetype at any scale you feel comfortable with. You know, and it, again, use not only the spatial values of, of the American strip, but it also inverted that, that meaning of the big box. Uh, so again, this became, you know, going back to the, to, to the origins, uh, we really use the, the, the long vista. Most public art, you know, is you, you see it in a gallery or you see it up close. This was designed to be seen from a distance. It really was. We call it, you know, making architecture both a subject matter, but also by moving away from it and, and seeing it at a distance. You were putting art where people least expected to find it. And that, was a, that had, a, had a real impact. It did, because it wasn't... They didn't have to go to a museum. They didn't have to be in a precious situation. They didn't have to be in an awkward. It was right in part of the you know, daily life. And it, that, those early buildings had a lot of controversial impact. They really did. It was amazing. Afterwards, they were always being used to show the collapse of America or the prime rate is going up or down. Or, you know, they were be often used in, in newspaper articles. So they were reproduced a lot for that. And then, strangely enough, after a while, you know, fragmentation became sort of popular. So kind of high design architects like Isosaki and James Sterling started using little bits of it, kind of, again, like the if you please version. But I, I just show this because, you know, what obviously what we were doing in the upper right-hand corner had nothing to do with this very kind of sweet, you know, textural sort of treatment of the idea. Well, we also dealt with equilibrium. Well, just all sorts of values of an architecture, things that you wouldn't expect architecture to deal with, you know, uh, in different kinds of spatial relationships. And, uh, if the, and then, of course, the, because I was part of that kind of art chart movement, all the artists were getting all these criticisms from the mainstream architecture world. So in architectural record, they were always using words called marginal architecture, alternative architecture, radical architecture, outsider architecture, paper architecture, or not real architecture. I always loved the not real. And I, I always say that so somebody had some kind of omnipotent idea of what constituted real. So the controversy became also part of the message. Also imitation. It was very interesting that this particular building, a, a number of architects imitated it in different forms. Frank Gehry did a tilted building and... Fuchsas did, but they did a fancy version. I think they lost the, the reason to do it. They're, they aren't inversions of archetypes or, or, or dealing with the junk world. Uh, they're dealing with high-end formalist, you know, design as they, as they always do. So it didn't really, it did, isn't it? But the worst example was a recent one. This is the Vorsinger uh, Sarkis at the World War II Museum where they just ripped this off completely. And you can see that by taking away the, the context of the situation and everything, they completely destroy the meaning. It just becomes a formalist, tilted slab. So um, I've kind of always resented this, but I think I want to point out the difference in the different kinds of where it doesn't become signage and where it does become signage, where it has a context and has a situation. And even this one was an interesting one because they just wanted us to, you know, a title their warehouse. It's a big warehouse structure, but across the county line, and it was interesting they, because on one side of the county line, you could have a 20 foot high sign. On the other side, you couldn't. So when we crossed the county line, we overlapped the letters so that they became abstract. And then we got a permission because on one side it was art, on the other side it was a sign. So that had a story as well. But anyway, this subject matter idea was, was the core. And this is one of the more intelligent statements that's been made about our work. I just wanted to read it because it is good. There's an architectural invention James Wines of Sight created that fascinates me. It consists of designing architecture as it is expected to be, yet this paradigm is being frozen, whoops, I'm sorry, frozen, corrupted, and dramatized in a way that cannot be ignored and therefore questions this paradigm. This technique is a perfect architectural adaptation of what the situationists were calling detourment. 
a form of acknowledgement that the resistance towards establishment can only be accomplished by the same establishment's weapons and pictorial objects, and therefore the hijacking of those weapons in order to flip them back towards their system of production. And this was written three or four years ago by a, in a magazine in Paris, and I've kept it because it, 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 there have been so many things that have misunderstood our work. I mean, the architectural record is a disaster in terms of, I collect all their, their criticism, but this one was really quite intelligent. And then I also wrote a book myself as a critique of architecture, a way of dissecting, shattering, dissolving, transforming prejudices about building and the interest of discovering new revelations among the fragments. And out of that came other buildings. Uh, this one was done because the, the actually owners of Best Price, well, you never celebrate what we do. So we said, okay, we're gonna celebrate what you sell and what you do and cut away through the building. And it was interesting because it went through a thermal barrier and on the inside, the real objects were in their full color form. And then there was an incredible sculptor who cast, you know, it was his life's work. He just was so dedicated to this job, but cast into metal everything that was on the inside of the building. So the entire building is encrusted. See all the bicycles on the outside are cast bicycles and all the ones on the inside are real. The best asset say, well, okay, what are we gonna do when the styles change? I say, you're gonna keep the window areas exactly like they are because then they'll become historic. It'll be like a museum of bicycles 20 years ago. So that was the idea. But one thing that did happen, they changed their logo. They got a high design logo and I got really upset because Part of taking advantage of archetypes or you know, commonplace situations or junk world is their old logo had that junk world character. It was just a simple little logo that you, know, you would never notice. As soon as you got this sort of growing company, you know, this was done, I guess, by uh, Chermaya or somebody. But anyway, it sort of ruined it in a way because it became too fancy or too much of a too much of a, of a language applied to the building. It was back to that application. But again, back to this project, you can see the difference between, you know, even the normal display of shopping centers and what we were trying to do here. And again, sort of again, like the opposite of the, uh, of the Pompidou Center, which was a celebration of technology, but this was a celebration of interior and exterior simultaneous events. We did other ones. We, this is one that, Unfortunately, it didn't get built, but it was one of my favorites, rolling the parking lot over the building. But it produced, a, after this building, there a huge number of rolling roofs appeared. And, and I just want to make the point that these are really about form, about making fancy forms. And this was really not about that. It was really about context and circumstance. It was a perverse, it was an inversion of circumstance. And these are really more like formalist buildings. So I think this is important. This is a project that we did that was really about human iconography people. And uh, this was a theoretical project really, but it was showing that you know, people live in pretty dreary suburbia or they lose all identity in the public domain. The idea was to build a building that was in fact invaded by people's own idiosyncrasies. You, you build a matrix and then they can invade it. It's sort of what uh, Marcel Duchamp called can chant. The, the canning situation is the, is the typical frame building. You frame it out and then you in, invade it. And Corbusier himself had sort of a similar idea, but he was gonna design all the inserts. So if you design all the inserts, then it's not a collage anymore. I, I was much more interested in these kind of inversions where the, the, the floors are actually left free and then the people invade them, and, and you, you do it like the old uh, Sears Roebuck houses, where you give them supply sources of any kind of doorways or windows or sidings or anything they wanted, and then they could, they could just plug in their own iconography. They could plug in whatever they, however they wanted to be seen to the world. And so this was a quite serious project, and this, this was a, a, a version where we were gonna take over the frame that was left from an old, um, department store building in New Jersey. And we actually really went pretty far with that. Uh, and then this is just to show what the, the point was, taking over buildings that were destined to be torn down, you could sort of re, refit them and then you could install, you know, like this and have, you know, I mean, you can see the difference where, where we call it identity and density, where your own identity or your family's identity or your choice of vegetation, everything became, you know, quite a contrast. Very different, of course, from the 
Trump plays, for example. Anyway, and, uh, th but again, it's very interesting. You know, after we did this project, and it was only theoretical, basically. Actually, there was a Japanese developer who wanted to do it, but then he, he went bankrupt uh, <laughs> for other reasons, not this. But, <laughs> but uh, then the building, everybody's been sending me ever since. So, you know, for the last 15 years, they've been saying, oh, I saw buildings just like your high rise of homes. And the funny thing is, they're not. They're, you know, none of them by prominent architects. But, you know, they're tacking windows and doors and vegetation, and they're doing, but they're not, they're all design building. They're all, that architect is controlling the situation, whereas the high-rise home was, was really supposed to be an urban collage, where, where the spontaneity of the inserts was, it was the, the result, the uncontrolled part, the, the, in the sense, chaos. Well, anyway, uh, I got interested in green, architecture, I wrote a book on green architecture and, and this idea of, you know, green as social, psychological, contextual, aesthetic as well, not just technological. So in that, in that sense, we did some of the last best buildings we did were, were like this. So like, uh, in Italy, I was fascinated by buildings being in, in, encrusted or where nature's revenge takes over. So we were doing it at a, a shopping center, an area where the people wanted to preserve the trees. In fact, we couldn't if we torn down all the oak trees, they wouldn't have let us build it. So we built the building around the, the trees and saved all the trees. And then that's, and really, it proved to be, a, you know, the most popular one of all, of course, because you had a whole garden and you went from outside to inside and you're still outside to go inside. So there was a layering of space and also the fact that the, you know, what should have been the interior was now the outside and, you know, people would, stay for lunch and you know, they spend the day there really it was like a park and then we took advantage i mean all landscape architects they're always decorating the surface of the earth and here we're on a hillside so we built the building so with with terrarium walls so you could actually see the geology of the area so the garden was really a view of the geology of that thing and this was they say a very probably the most popular building again because it engaged with Nature. We did the same thing in Florida. We made a rainforest building, again preserving all the vegetation, putting it back, and then putting uh, water, water, water walls in front of it. So, and it was marvelous because it, it, you know, you, the building was always moving. It was always refracting in light, and because of the running water, it was always changing, changing light and value. And we did a series of restaurants, um, which you know, again, the, so going back to the, the Googie style, you know, which I, I showed you before and the classic McDonald's. The classic McDonald's is always the best building they ever did. And it was sad that they went to the, the mansard style that, that, that sort of took over the world. I don't know why that, that, what that icon means, but anyway, it, did, it, it consumed the fast food world. And uh, so this, there was that mansard mania in the 70s. And uh, we got this job uh, from McDonald's. It was actually a an area near Chicago that uh, where Ray Kroc had been born, so near his birthplace. So they wanted something special. And so we showed them all the, you know, typical fast food, same as, you know, casual dining, all the type of restaurants. They all look exactly the same. And, uh, but, so we did the floating McDonald's. It was very funny because what happened was they had just changed. This was 1984, I think. They had just adapted this mansard style. So we had this meeting with the president. Uh, I remember he, he said, well, you know, we, want, we hear you're very inventive and you can be as inventive or imaginative as you want, but you can't change anything. <laughs> and so that was our directive for this thing. So we said, well, what can you do? You just, we'll just use their parts. So that was the idea. We just pop, pop you know, they had all this, this, you know, prototype kit of parts. So we just took their kit of parts and popped it apart and we did a floating McDonald's. And so in a funny way, we did, did exactly what the client had asked for. It was, it was signage. The signage was all the same. The building was the sign and it was a floating. And it was great because you could recognize your friends by their feet. You could see them under the building. Children played under the building. You could watch your kids. And it also got a lot of light in the building by lifting up the, the walls. You had a you know, kind of a nicer atmosphere. Uh, this one, of course, is, a, is the one was the most successful thing we ever did, primarily, I guess, because of Danny Meyer. 
But uh, we did the first Shake Shack. They completely destroyed it, as you probably know. They rebuilt it. It looks like a suburban house now. But the original one was uh, it's sort of to take advantage of that perverse situation where the urban strip and the old, the old hamburger stands on the highways and then put them into a pastoral park and make it all work, make it where, where you know, there's people interaction. So the idea was to take the menu and make the menu the whole building. The building is the menu in a way. And uh, again, we're also cribbing off the uh, close by uh, flat iron building with the ribbing and the park and the strip and the, the, all the you know, kind of auto culture and everything. And it all kind of combined together. This is some of the sketches and things we did for it. It all kind of came together and became the, the Shake Shack. But this is an interesting too. Talk about you know kind of the end of, of, of imaging. This this really did have a you know very simple. It's incredibly inexpensive to do. The smallest smallest building we ever did, and ironically now that it's destroyed, there's a book coming out in Berlin. The 100 most iconic buildings of New York, and the Shake Shack is one of them, but it doesn't it isn't really there anymore. What they did is, as you can see, they, they, they rebuilt it and, and made it bigger. And I told them, well, if you make it bigger, let's just change the proportions. They didn't. They made it out of plastic, and they, did, they didn't use a real eye beam to make the thing. So they all flattened it all out. So you can see that they, they, they truly changed the whole feeling of the building, the scale of it and everything. So it doesn't feel like a tiny little roadway icon anymore. You say it looks like a kind of a suburban house. Uh, anyway, uh, this is, yeah, this, we were, it had a little bit the same situation with Denny's. They wanted to build a building in Las Vegas. Si again, signage was a big issue because the whole city is signage. And we said, well, you've got to make, again, the building as a sign. And they wanted to, you know, sort of make a 21st century diner, a diner experience. And so we looked at diners and they're all horizontal and linear and metallic and flowing and roadway oriented. But we're also in the you know high tech age. There's also the internet, so we sort of combine these two things. You know the, the the fact that Denny's was was always about the family and communication and the idea of you know building. And this was interesting because it was a building within a building. So what we did is we took all of this imagery and pulled it together. And right there in that corner, we built the 21st century icon, uh, which was both a social network a, a kind of transferred into an imagery and uh, it, it it again was you know built as this sort of insert into so it's a building within a building which i i liked a lot the idea you can see how it was done this was done by zayner actually he did a very nice job but um uh, and you know again this goes from inside to outside but one thing we put in is a we used the same vocabulary to make a, a wedding chapel and there's been, I guess by now, there's almost been a hundred weddings there. <clears throat> I can't imagine getting wed married in Denny's, but a lot of people have liked to do it. So there's, there's actually Denny's is a, a place for marriage. But again, it goes back to signs and symbols. And it was even with the slightest suggestion of a, of a little chapel there. And we, you can move the chairs around. You can turn it around and it becomes a little uh, altar and you can, you can get married. There's a, a couple getting married. Uh, and then the outside, because it was this kind of lacy thing, I mean, there's this uh, zip line where the people are floating over your head all day. So we thought that another advantage of having a kind of a lacy, you know, building like a, like a network was also that people sit in the piazza and look up and see the, the, uh, the people going by. Well, sure enough, uh, Bob Venturi once said to me, she always got to photograph your building 15 minutes after you finish it or they're going to destroy it. And uh, absolutely, you know, within, within the first six months, the company people, in-house in designers, got after it, and that's what they did to it. They just completely, and we had already provided that we were always said, well, you can use the always open around the top lane. They just filled it with that signage that they thought they needed, sort of, again, sort of destroyed it. Well, this is a happy story. I'll end with a short happy story. This is a, a park, an a art park in Italy. And uh, we did the pavilion and it's a residence for the curator and everything. But it's a beautiful art park and it's um, near Lake Como in that region, mountainous. And also there's a 
stone walls that cover the entire property. So again, the image of the place, the place is completely, for us anyway, the existence of these wonderful stone walls and the farmland, it's a farmland as well, as well as an art park. So we just tried to pick up on something, that, again, that's already there. We're very, very much going back to the best idea where the big box is already there, so you have to change and invert and deal with that meaning, but keep that, that recognizable factor. The idea was to keep the recognizable factor of the wall and then just make the building out of the wall. And we created these T-shaped columns so that we could use them for everything, for mounting sculpture, for, for the building, for columns. So we, it was a cast stone column. That was our one element that linked the whole property. And as you can see, we just kind of building just emerges right out of the landscape. This is the existing wall. And then we just, our wall just goes right into the village, curves around and goes out the other side and creates a, a building that's totally enmeshed in the, in the side. And you can see it's the, the columns sort of wander out from the building around the property. And so the entire signage of the property is just you recognize it by the T-shaped columns and the existing walls and the, and the fusion of the two. We added, of course, to the walls. But so that became the signage for the property. You almost didn't, really didn't need a sign because wherever you are and you see those columns in the wall, you know where you are. And the inside is sort of, uh, we, the only real extravagance we did, uh, it's a very ecological building because it's all built out of materials from within about a 10 kilometer radius. That was one thing we tried to do here. But we did make a glass stairway because of the views out of the countryside and the mountains and the Swiss Alps are so beautiful. And this was opening day, it just opened uh, in 2009. But it, it's again a very people oriented space. And it also complements, it, it plays a kind of complementary juxtaposition with the, with the uh, monastery. The monastery is on the hill behind. So, you can see through the building to the monastery and to the landscape. Well, anyway, um, just to end this is, is we are in the computer age. We are in the age of, of computer symbols and signs. And there are many ways to, many ways to find, I mean, so many fonts now are trying very hard and, and successfully to express what the building is about. Not only is the building trying to express it in, in some cases, but the fonts as well. I mean, the cosine uh, project here is, is exceptional. I mean, uh, you've done things right here that are, 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 are quite wonderful because a sign is not just a sign. It, it, by, by both the selection of font and the uh, uh, you know, inclusion of other elements, it becomes more and more the building and then the building becomes a sign. So it, it, it's, it's not an idea that's going away. In fact, in fact, I see it growing. The one thing that uh, I, you know, from my personal perspective versus what's going on in architecture is I came from sculpture. So, you know, making forms and shapes for their own sake was not my main interest. I, I like Duchamp's basis. I'm interested in ideas, not mere visual products. And so much of what's been built, you know, over the last 20, 30 years is is very much about let's make the shape. Let's put, you know, sculptural shapes together. And they remain rather isolated, almost like, like they're on pedestals. They're like sculptures on pedestals. So once it's on the pedestal, then the pedestal becomes that kind of bleak plaza that I was talking about. It's not included in the process. And I, my, my word to design students now is really there there's, seems to be two forces that uh, I'm a little too old to start over, but these are some great forces in the, in the world. It's, for example, the whole computer technology and cyberspace are all about systems. They're all, they have an iconography and imagery in, unto themselves. If Corbusier was designing today, he would not be celebrating the machine for living in. He would be seen, you know, finding something in the digital invisible world. Uh, and it always seems to be sort of weird that why would you use the most advanced technology to design buildings that look like Henry Moore sculptures you know, from the 50s? It's like a 50s form made with the most advanced technology. And the same goes with the, the Green Movement. Um, it like, very much like the technology. It's also uh, a system. It's a process-oriented thing. And there are so many lessons from from living with nature and finding alternative fuels and everything 
So it, it, it seems absurd to repeat the industrial age. I mean, look, here's Chernikov in 1931 and, and Rem Koolhaas in 1995, and, there, and you don't feel that there's any really deep change in, in image or, or message, really. And I think that that's the lesson. And there are all these wonderful words now, nature and biochemistry and hydrology and geology and meteorology and communication. You've got cybernetics and television, virtual reality, and mass media. You've got a, a load of, of ideas that are not like, you know, 1950s sculpture. They really aren't. And then when you go back to the source again, this is, again, the most important thing that I think probably ever happened in the human condition is the invention of language and how, and again, how you use it. And so, it's, you know, again, we live in this world and the world still has a public domain. There's still a reason to communicate. And as that little picture up there on the right says, it, you know, the, the, the you know, phone, the iPhone is not the only way, best way to communicate. There are, is the public domain, it is, still exists and it's, it's still an incredible place. And that's it. And thank you very, very much. Okay.